you remember old school when we used to duct tape your waist? Like we used to like do that, like where you would wear a corset? No, I'm in my 20s. Okay, <laughs> damn me. Hey guys, before we get into the video, I wanna give a quick shout out to the sponsor of today's episode, Drift. Drift is the sister company of one of our other sponsors, Scentbird. Where Scentbird brings the smell goods to your body, Drift brings the smell goods to your car and your home. Rather than like those cheap little clip-ons you put in the vents or the Christmas tree from like the mirror, Drift provides sleeker options with sustainable materials like metal and wood for $9 or stone for $14. And their scents use natural essential and fragrance oils. I got this wood and metal clip which matches like the wood trim in my car. It has a rich teak smell and it honestly makes me like feel like a grown up. Like it's just like a, it's like a grown up smell, but not like old people smell like your grandpa's car. It just, it just smells mature. You know what I mean? Basically it doesn't smell like I'm using a gas station air freshener to fight off the Taco Bell smell. It looks nice. It smells really nice. And they actually sent this to me a couple weeks ago and it's still going strong. Unfortunately, we all get nose blind after a while and we start to get bored of the same scent, but Drift also offers a subscription service where every month you can receive a limited edition fragrance that goes with the month, the season, or just any other scent of your choosing. And by subscribing to Drift and reusing their little block tablet clip-on thingies, you're also helping with their message of sustainability. And unlike most subscription plans, their plan is very flexible. On top of choosing whichever fragrance you want, you can also choose how frequently they deliver it to you. And you can cancel at any time with no penalty. And if you want to try Drift yourself, go to drift.com and use my coupon code MADDY at checkout, M-A-D-D-Y, and get up to 55% off your first order. Links in the description. And with that, on to the video. Hi guys, welcome back to Give It To Me Straight, Taylor's version. On the show today, we have the crossover star from RuPaul's Drag Race season five and Dragula season four, Miss J. Jolie. Hi everyone, I'm so excited. Yeah, welcome, it was nice to have you. I'm glad you could find time in your busy touring schedule to <laughs> stop in. Thank you so much. First of all, can I say how adorable this is? Yeah, thank you. I, I gotta take like, a moment to appreciate your Taylor look right now. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I like it too because it's, um, Aside from like making the shirt, it's like the easiest Taylor look to pull off, I think. It's like the most comfortable. I get to wear like my little pajama pants. I'm here for it too. You look adorable. Thank you. <laughs> but this is a really busy time for you right now because like with the Taylor stuff, like yeah. you are like extra booked and busy right now. Is it like every time you hear like a tour cycle, you're just like, here we go. Well, to be honest, um, no, actually this year kind of popped off in a way I was not expecting. Uh, I did this with the Reputation Tour and I did my best. I was just starting to kind of work as much as I have been a sailor. Yeah. This has been such a dream and it's um, everything that I've done, you know, Drag Race, or Dragula, Bad Porn, this is the best thing that I've ever done. I just gotta say, to go out and feel confident and be surrounded by a bunch of people that love the same thing, it's just, it's so powerful. You mm -hmm. know, um, I am a huge Sailor Swift fan, as might be a shock to you, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this has just been awesome and the Airs Tour is, it's really connected all the Swifties from every era, no matter when you started loving her or feeling connected, kind of brought like all these different age ranges mm -hmm. and just kind of like made this massive Swiftie community I think is bigger than it was even before, to be honest. Yeah. And you know she's a real fan because this is not sponsored at all. She's not <laughs> saying this. She wasn't even it's paid totally to say It's totally free. Yeah. I'm not like, Taylor Nation, I <laughs> do you know, none of that. Yeah. No, this has really <laughs> just been like me supporting, trying to go around and just being part of the fandom. You know, I've, I'm a Swifty myself, so mm -hmm. it's just really awesome just being a fan and doing what I love and yeah, no expectations. Mm -hmm. it, it's crazy like going from like your small town gigs and then like being known as like the Taylor personator, like doing all these Taylor gigs and then going to like Dragula and rebranding and then just immediately going back to Taylor gigs. It's just the whiplash. It is. keeps me entertained with myself. Um, for me, I, I just, I, I always have to be entertained. Um, but I will say, I think being multi multifaceted is, I think it's a strength, you know, kind of being a chameleon and being able to jump in and jump out. Like, why not? Yeah, you know, a lot of queens, you know, they pick one awful gig and do it the whole rest of their life. <laughs> so the fact that you have more than one Thank you know, you. decent gig, you know. And now I can fail at three, it. so. <laughs> yeah, why stop there? So, why stop Baby, there? Baby, Camp Kiki's next on my list. I will leave in a hair outfit on this episode six. So yeah. <laughs> prepare yourself. Jay Jolie, Camp Kiki season six. Why do you think I came first. to Vegas? I had to get this heat, you know? Yeah, Learn yeah. how I could <laughs> go to camp and do well, drag. Speaking of Vegas, uh, like I actually found out recently that you just moved to Vegas. I thought you had been here for a while. Actually, yeah. I've been here about a year and a half and usually I'm very much out in my community I've always been a big party social girl mm -hmm. but Vegas was kind of my new start after Dracula at my age I'm getting a little bit older and I just kind of wanted to reel it in and see what was important to me and just kind of just focus on myself and make sure I'm putting something decent out there if I'm going to keep doing this <laughs> yeah 
Well, because like before this, you lived in uh, Louisville, like play play Louisville. You're like one of the eight girls, Drag Race girl, yeah. Dragula. So why did you decide to make the move to Vegas and like start fresh, essentially? Oh, well, I mean, I, being part of that cast was honestly incredible. I don't think I would even be the entertainer I was had I not worked around so many different people of so many different facets of drag, pageants, whatever you may call it. But I think that that is a time in my life that I will always just be so grateful for. Those girls are rock stars. And to me, like, I'm a fan of all of them. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of felt like it was time to just... Uh, start something new and follow my dream. I was there for almost a decade and I love Louisville, but like this is a dream coming to Las Vegas. I love this city. So I'm like so excited. I feel yeah. like, <laughs> big, you know, pig in the city, babe, you know, like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, and it's also like the babe pig in the city because you did come from like the farmland. But it's, it's so interesting to me too that you came from like Christian fundamentalist family in like a, a farm town like Gainesville or like Alachua? Well, actually Alachua, I always say Gainesville, home of mm -hmm. Tebow and Gatorade because no one even knows what Alachua is. But yeah. If you go deeper into the woods and a little bit scarier and more Baptist then you find Alachua. Yeah. Gainesville is what Alachua thinks the big city is. <laughs> yes, but you move from exactly. there to Gainesville and then you move to the big city of Louisville, Kentucky. So like, wh why did you not move to like a bigger city like somewhere more metropolitan? Why like Kentucky? Well, to be honest, you know, that side of the world, Midwest, they love drag. Mm -hmm. And the clubs out there are incredible. I always have been such a huge fan of Play Nashville. So I really felt like I just got this lucky break after Drag Race that I was even considered to be one of their first cast members. Mm -hmm. um, I opened Play Louisville. Like I was one of the original girls there. And I just felt like an honor. I felt like when you get to go and you're one of the first, you really get to like build and be part of something. And it's like, you know, whatever it may become, it's like you're kind of part of that foundation. Mm -hmm. And to me, that seemed really cool. Yeah. So your answer is because I had stock. That's what, <laughs> that's what yeah, you're saying. <laughs> more so. Yeah. yeah, in a good way. Um, yeah. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm starting to regret that. Thing the, life. I'm starting to regret those cheap Amazon wig. <laughs> that's what I get for cutting corners. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm going to get a talk show where I don't have to spend a lot of money, just sit in my room and film stuff. <laughs> but now I'm getting early onset blindness in my right eye from a cheap Amazon wig. But. I talk about blindness. I will say the one thing Dragula needs is an eye care plan. <laughs> The amount, like we, don't, like we don't need queen care. We oh, need no. The amount plan. of time I have like shoved my fingers dirtily into my cornea, dropped yeah. my freaking contacts, picked it up from the floor. I'm like, well, this is true. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I, I can sufficiently say I can't really see what you look like right now, but I, <laughs> I'm sure it's great. I look amazing <laughs> from a distance. <laughs> well, like, speaking of contacts, like, we'll, we'll talk more about Dragula in a moment. Yeah. But just talking about contacts. Was it like scary whenever you went to Dragula wearing contacts all the time? So I know you had a scary incident once where like you thought your contact had fallen out. Turns out it rolled into like the back of your eye and you found it later. Well, imagine that like on the amount of like marijuana that I smoke every day. So uh -huh. I was just having a full down mental breakdown of being so stoned and then realizing that like, well, at first I thought I was like, am I possessed? You know, like the triple eyes. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I knew it. I said there was something dark in me. But <laughs> over time, um, I just learned you just got to get in there like the claw machine and you just got to start digging them out. So I don't know. I, does Dragula need a vision plan or do you just need to calm the fuck down? Like it's, <laughs> I like, think it's the, a spirit the, thing of both. <laughs> the way you describe like fishing a contact out is, sounds more unhinged than what I think a normal person <laughs> would be doing. Well, if you ever do it gracefully, I mean, Maddie told me earlier, if you were to gracefully put a contact in, it would be like, I mean, I used to take 45 minutes. Uh -huh. At one point, I was just like, you got to just give up your eyesight for a contact. <laughs> for contacts. You don't think. You don't, though. No. <laughs> I just like, we just saw a moment ago, I was struggling with my contact and I was like, let me just take a moment and just kind of like rub it in. Yeah. It took all of like but 30 seconds. That's like what your first pass to be alternative is a freaking contact though. Cause you're like, you're spooky now. You know what I mean? So spooky. Cause you have a permanent single eye that's whited out. It's not even the contact. You blinded yourself. Basically. No, I, I just think maybe, have you had like your dexterity check? Like a physical therapist? It might be something like that. <laughs> Can you imagine this is the conversation that's had if you find out that you had like nerve damage in your hand all these years without realizing it? I mean... This is the moment, the life-changing moment. It's always best not to know. I remember whenever I was in like fourth grade, I was like looking at the board like squinting mm -hmm. and the teacher was like, Can I talk to you for a moment? And I'm just like, am I in trouble? And she's like, can you read that poster over there? And I'm like, no, it's so far away. Uh -huh. She's like, huh, I think you need glasses. And that, that was the conversation where I realized that I was like blind. So maybe this is the conversation you need. It's like, hey, I think you might be physically disabled in your hands. Well, I was a child that just wanted glasses, so I always tried to pretend that I w I couldn't see as a kid. Mm -hmm. I was just like, where am I? You manifested it. I did you, manifest yeah, it, you, for sure. Like, don't let your dreams be dreams. I made like, that I up, one Helen Keller joke, and I'm almost there. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> joke's well, on me. 
No, you didn't see that coming, did no, you? No, sure. <laughs> anyway, back on topic. Okay. <laughs> but speaking of your family, you did come from like a Christian fundamentalist family. Did your family like, did they support like your drag journey or was it very much like napkin over the shoulder, I'm going to do it on my own type situation? You know, um, to be honest, I, you know, this isn't knocking my mom or anything. I think uh, I was kicked out at 16 at her young age and that's kind of in a time when I created Jade mm -hmm. uh, to kind of make my world better. And to me, she's always kind of been like a hero to me. You know, growing up in that household, I felt like I just didn't have a voice and it felt very hard to ever express how I felt. And then Jade came along and then I could start saying how I felt and kind of defending myself and protecting myself. Mm -hmm. And just recently I reconnected with my mom. And to be honest, I think maybe it's just getting older or, or learning more, but I just, I want to love people for what they love and accept them. And she, I will say when you put that effort out for people, they'll give it in return. And lately my mom has been so accepting of all of this and proud of all, you know, just also us having an open community of conversation about things. Mm -hmm. I was very defensive as a kid. Uh, I'm just quick. I always wanted to be like a lawyer. I remember I went to Halloween once and I dressed as a lawyer and everyone thought I was an insurance salesman and it pissed me off so bad because I was like, I'm a lawyer, you know, because mm -hmm. I just wanted to fight. But so, so ended the tale of your career as a lawyer impersonator. <laughs> yeah, but... I was there in Brockovich of Gainesville, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Jane Schwartz at 13. <laughs> So like you kicked out at 16, was it because of like your sexuality? Was that the reason? Yeah, honestly, yeah, it, that was the main reason. And um, that's kind of like what started my whole life in, as drag. I, I went to Jacksonville, Florida and I started at Metro. And from there, I kind of never stopped doing drag. Did you immediately just start performing? Like, is that like the catalyst that started it? Or was it just something you found along the way? Well, gosh, I shouldn't even really talk about this. I have like a fake ID and stuff. So it was really, they were letting me perform at 17. 2002 so. was a different time. Yeah, you know, back None then. of my viewers were even born yet, <laughs> so it's fine. It was a different time. I did have a fake ID. So everyone's like, well, how is she in the club? Um, you know, it was gracious. And I was living a young Euphoria VHS version of it back then. So I will say I was lucky. And also, too, I will say that a lot of the people in the community did throw me a lot of kindness and threw me a bone. You know, mm -hmm. there were so many people that did protect me. Um, but yeah, I will say I'm just really fortunate. I, I, no matter what good or bad has came from this, I will say, you know, drag has saved my life in so many beautiful ways. And that's really what I was ever trying to say on Drag Race when I went. It just looks like I'm poor, which I was. But I created everything out of nothing. And I feel like that was the one thing I always wanted to be said is that I think there's so many people out there that drag does save them and they can create anything out of anything that they have. And that has value. You know, I've never wanted... I didn't think I'd be sitting here in all of this. You know, I worked so hard all these years, but this isn't necessarily what makes me happy. You know, it's about doing what makes you, doing it's what makes you happy, yeah. you know? So. You're like, I don't even like Taylor Swift. No, I love Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> so like, like savior. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you had a, I, I know like a lot of queens, especially queens like in the South, they go through like big pageant phases. You weren't really a big pageant queen, but you did win a title at one point. You were like, <laughs> you won the Miss Jacksonville Beach pageant. I did. Right? That is my big like little claim baby to fame. Look, yeah. <laughs> I was so proud in that picture right there. I know. You You are beaming in this photo. This is, and it's a beautiful crown on a $35 Amazon <laughs> wig. Well, first of all, my, okay, so one of my drag mother is Dana Douglas, who uh -huh. is like molded after the Continental Trophy, as she's known. She's like a world renowned, you know, Continental pageant star so she I feel like she wanted me to have that so bad and mm -hmm. it did feel great like trying to do that but I, I just I was so bad at it like the most proud actually I wasn't proud of that I was proud at Miss Glamorous I competed there and I think I was 14th place but I won most beautiful and I was like oh yeah you freaking goblins like I really felt yeah. like I just won the lottery because I was like <laughs> so beautiful you know what I mean yeah. but it's just I I don't know if that was I, I feel like almost it, creating all the stuff for pageants is so much fun. But when I get up there, I feel like the expectations almost like melts me. If I'm not just like having fun and it's natural, mm -hmm. it almost feels overwhelming. It's almost like my anxiety. I, I just, I, I don't, you know, if that makes sense, like it has to yeah. be like off the cuff or kind of like, it can be planned, but not to the extent of pageants. Like I give it up to anyone that does that because it's such a level of perfection that I will never achieve. It's just like... <laughs> Hey. You know, it's incredible. So maybe I was like, hang the hat, gal. After Miss yeah. Jacksonville Beach, I was like, Live your truth. it will never get yeah. bigger than that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so as you were saying before, like a big thing that you did was like illusions. And like, mm -hmm. obviously what you're most known for now is your Taylor Swift illusion. And I would argue that you were probably the world's most famous Taylor Swift impersonator. Thank you. The best, really. questionable, but definitely <laughs> the most prolific. But like with, with that, like why did you lean so heavily to Taylor Swift? Like all the pop icons and divas, why her? After meeting her, she really genuinely is such a kind person, giving everyone time, everyone's seen. 
And I feel like I've almost convinced myself more to be a better person just emulating her. And I think there's like power in that. The level of star power she has created, you know, to have this type of fandom, it, it's definitely made me a stronger entertainer. You know, I don't think I've ever reached this type of confidence until I've done this. Um, and also too, it's, it's hard to look like people. <laughs> no one ever knows that, but it's took time. You know, after Drag Race, that was not my planned character. And I really felt like I dishonored her because I'm such a fan and it was such like on the cuff that I feel like I always had to like prove to her that I can do it better. Mm -hmm. And so then it just kind of became an obsession and then here we are now, so. But like doing the Taylor impersonation, it definitely like worked out for you like career-wise. It provided you like so many open doors, so many opportunities. And you actually got a chance to play, portray Taylor Swift in the music video for You Need to Calm Down. Was the call for that opportunity more exciting than any of the other calls you've received? I'm not Is even gonna like... lie, 100%. <laughs> it, it just like blew everything out of the water. What did that conversation sound like? Uh, well, for one, it didn't even feel real, to be honest. Like to think that Taylor would even saw what I was doing is bizarre. I realized I know it was with me and a bunch of the other Drag Race girls. Mm -hmm. But for me, like what that felt being a Swifty, I just don't know if I ever could really show or express how much that meant to me, you know, going into there. And so when we got there and I kind of got that one line or whatever, I felt like that little girl in the Missy Elliott videos that was always like, you know, singing yeah, Missy. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, it was such an honor that to this day, I just feel like I needed that. And just having that stamp from Taylor or allowing me just to have the opportunity to feel seen and special, it really has changed my life, how hard I have worked as Taylor and just to be part of the Swifty fandom. and. It's so weird. It's like, obviously, I'm um, Trailer Swift, not Taylor Swift. I'm like mm. the bad version. But yeah. I really do care about the Swifty fandom and how I portray myself and how I make them feel. Like, that's why I try to go all in with costumes, props, whatever I can. I think that matters. You know, it's not just portraying the artists. It's also being a part of their fandom and being part about, you know, the whole family of it. With that music video, though, like, what was that experience like? Was it a lot of, like, one-on-one, -on -one, like, working with Taylor? Or was it, like, just kind of, like, bouncing around with the queens? Like, what was the experience like for you, like, overall? Well, so that day was really odd. We got there really early. It was, like, a red-eye flight, um, and it started raining massively. Like, we were in drag, oh, my goodness, like, like five, six in the morning. And so when we were all hanging out, uh, we just have to keep pushing off production. And that's why Taylor came and hung out with us. She drank with us. She literally made like little coasters handmade that she like snuck in the charcuterie boards. Like she was just so down to earth to come and just, she was so apologetic for how the weather was as if she could control that. And then just stayed and was like present for all of us, you know? And honestly, I will say I was keen with everyone, but my two favorite things that day was Taylor and Delta Work. I love Delta Work. And when she walked in that room, mm -hmm. I just can't even tell you, I like ripped my tits off. I just, she is one of the funniest and most warm, fun people to be on set with or to do things with, show, whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. So I will tell you, Delta, Taylor. Well, has, has uh, Delta booked you for her show yet? <laughs> well, for my own curiosity. Uh, no, we definitely have talked about it and I would love to do it. It's Right now it's just been really hard now with traveling and all that, I think. Mm -hmm. but she, we have talked about it and you will see me. That's my next journey. Okay, but so. she hasn't made time for you yet. <laughs> her, I'm just, I'm make sure I get the story correct, make sure I know what's going on. <laughs> She's very busy girl. But as a Taylor Swift impersonator, you also had a moment, like I know there's been times where other impersonators have been mistaken for the celebrity mm -hmm. and you got mistaken for Taylor Swift by John Travolta, like on the stage. <laughs> Whenever you were all going up, you and all the queens were going up to accept the award for yeah. You Need to Calm Down, John Travolta almost handed you the award. He had to do a double take. How affirming was that as an impersonator for you? Actually, it was completely frightening because being such a fan of my artist, I, I'm so awkward and weird. Like, I, you almost see me being like this. I was like, could you imagine grabbing your most like legendary artist? Like, I don't know, to me, that was like, what would I have done, you know? Mm -hmm. And then later, Taylor said, you should have just grabbed it. And she thought it was so funny, but Ultimately, to me, I was just, I didn't want to dishonor her or obviously, you know, ruin her moment. <laughs> I'm like, this is my moment, you know? <laughs> Could you imagine the out the, the backlash from the Swifties? If you accepted the award, you're like, thank you. <laughs> Yo, I, no, I can't. Yeah. That would have literally <laughs> ended me, so no. I will say it does make you feel like illusionist. It does make you feel good. Like, just having those moments of, like, I am doing a good job. Because it felt so silly. Like, it took years. People used to be like, you look like Taylor. You could emulate Taylor. I really didn't see it. And it just kind of took time to, yeah, I don't know, just every little accomplishment you have or feel like, wow, I really am making people feel this way mm -hmm. or because, you know, a lot of his feelings are mannerisms. It's, it's a lot into details. I feel like it's not just anyone can slap a face on, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can impersonate or give people that feeling of that artist, if that makes sense. Yeah, because it's like you, it's like even despite the fact that you don't really look like Taylor and you mm -hmm. sound like Lindsay Lohan, but from a distance. <laughs> 
and lip sync. I have the... lost my voice. Yeah. I told you I was showing up as Dina Lohan. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to give you that uh, whatever that was in season five, but I didn't think you could provide me with that much Xanax, so I yeah. didn't want to tempt it. <laughs> it's like it's like a mix between like Taylor Swift and like Louis Armstrong, you know? <laughs> just uh, yeah. I've just been smoking palm balls for a very long time. It sounds like it, you're you're back. You're like that one lady at the gas station back in <laughs> Alachua, you know? Just yeah. Returning to just your roots. Not it. <laughs> And we'll cut here. Yeah, okay. How closely are you with Taylor Swift? Like, are you guys sending each other memes? Or is it just, like, strictly business? Yeah, I'm not going to pretend. I think we're closer in my mind. Okay. (laughs) Just because I love her so much. Um, But I will tell you, I think the moments we shared, I think I've gotten pretty close to my artists, at least having intimate moments and sharing Mm -hmm. an actual, you know, conversation and getting just to be around her. You know, um, I got to go to her after party, you know, after the VMAs. And that was really cool because just hanging out with also her dancers. And like, if you're a real Swifty, we know the Starlights, we know who they all are. So it was just, it was really cool just being there and being part of stuff. I I was really hoping you were gonna be like, oh no, we text each other actually, we're really (laughs) close. Cause I was like gonna be like, if you FaceTimed her, cause that'd be such a good soundbite for the show. Yeah, but also at the same time, like- so much notoriety and clout to the show. But I, instead, but it's just Jay. <laughs> no, I do feel like also it's the same thing. I never like want to push anything because like when you love someone at that level, I feel like we've had such great moments, and I do feel honored to still be amongst the Taylor Swift universe. So mm-hmm. I'm manifesting. We'll see each other again. Yeah, <laughs> we'll make out. But if Taylor Swift had not become like the mega star she is today, whose coattails would you be riding instead? Do you think? <laughs> I would probably be writing Carly Rae Jepsen's, to be honest. <laughs> I, I am actually a huge Carly Rae Jepsen fan. Um, I don't know. There's certain people I feel like, I always do feel like I do have a similarity to Carly Rae Jepsen. I feel like mm-hmm. I do see it. I read all the evil TikTok comments. Um, but it doesn't got to be evil. They always make it that way. But I'm like, yeah. it's still a compliment. I think it's like an honor, you know. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Taylor has the fan base. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with impersonation, I know for drag, impersonation is kind of like, fading out as like an art form like a lot of queens aren't doing illusions do you think that illusions as an art form is dying oh my gosh that's like such a fair question i talk about this all the time when i have like two shots in me um in a weird sense yeah yes and no you know there are so many a lot of entertainers who have been doing that for years but i also see people not appreciating them like they used to you know i grew up watching impersonators and like the way to see they would be like praised and treated almost like drag race girls Now I do feel like it is a little different, but I wish that, I think the one thing we're missing now is we don't really have a lot of impersonators bringing forward a lot of current artists or pushing the fold outside of, I guess, what we've always seen or had. And not saying that I love it, like I love Dolly, I want to see Eliza, I want to see all of that. I would just love to see people doing a lot of more current artists and stuff, you know, just traveling and stuff and seeing the way people feel when they love that artist. It is a feeling unlike anything I can even express, you know, uh, maybe the girls, on Drag Race, you know, have reached that level of fame. But for me, you know, kind of being Bat Girls girl, like I just never really experienced that type of love and like excitement. And with illusions, I do get that. And it's just as like, feels so warm and cozy and like, I don't know, you're really grateful for it. Do you feel like drag is like a staple of like queer culture should be more rooted in tradition and maintaining those roots? Or do you think as an art form, it's more important for it to progress with the times and evolve? I feel like it should be like an equal balance to be honest, because you need to remember what came before to even appreciate the new things that are coming. I mean, everything is a new version of something that was before. You know, granted over time, we're learning more. You know, there's also so many factors to so many things of why I will say it's great to have, why we need all this progression. But it feels kind of sad sometimes, like people almost being erased and people that were the reasons why I did drag or, you know, Coco or just a lot of my friends and stuff. And then they were so celebrated in that time. And then now it's like, then we're nothing. It just, to me, that breaks my heart. We all want to be remembered. We all want to make a mark and we all want to make an impact on people. So, you know, those people were such an impact on me. It, as we progress, it, progression shouldn't be a reason to eliminate the hard work and inspirations of the past, you know. With drag illusions kind of like fading in popularity amongst queens, do you think that's more due in part of queens being able to focus more on like their own self-expression? Or do you think it's more to do with just like queens forgetting that art form and like the desire to do it? No, that's a fair question. Um, to be honest, I, I really don't have, I don't know, you know, I don't. Um, I, it's so weird to think that almost like there was this big fad of like everyone wanted to be an illusionist at one point and stuff and to see it fade away, I, I really don't understand. But I, I guess in the sense, like you said, I think self-expression is so important. And I do agree, maybe that could be a huge factor where people were like, I want you to see me. And 
you know, I feel like I was lucky that a lot of people did, which is why now I try to hide it. <laughs> but no, but for, you know, for Taylor, it's just, I like looking up to Taylor just because I don't think I've ever been the most professional, the most together, the most kind, but I really love emulating her because she has this sense of strength, power, and pushing in this industry that I would even love to have an ounce of. And if I can make people feel like that, and also it just kind of, kind of keeps pushing me in drag to keep doing better. Where I don't know if I would have that just as Jade right now. So segueing into Drag Race, okay. whenever you audition for Drag Race, you actually auditioned for season four. I did. Uh, and you actually made it to like the top 20, but didn't make it through. But then you but then you made it onto the next season, season five. What was like going through your mind? Where were you at in life whenever you got that call? Like you were talking about, I was just creating all that stuff in my hometown. And it's so funny looking at it now, like the amount of confidence I shouldn't have had <laughs> looking at mm. me, but you just couldn't tell me anything. Like who would look like that and start an argument with Alyssa Edwards now? Like, you know what I mean? Like mm. get out of here. And to be honest, she was one of my closest friends on the show, but just no one would ever tell me that my drag was bad. And so, like, when I found out, I was just, like, <laughs> genuinely shocked, <laughs> you know? I was like, like, huh? like, you know, it was like, girl, you miss hot dog, hodgepodge, McDonald's queen. I'm like, hot dog? Hodgepodge? <laughs> you know, I'm, like, taking my McDonald's toys yeah. off me. I'm like, what do you mean? You know? Like, <laughs> and I had this obsession with, like, blending four hard fronts and thinking that they were one wig together. Mm. <laughs> and also, no one would ever tell me. You know, I was like, girl, I'm so pussy, pussy, cunt, 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 slay. You know, and I'm just mm -hmm. out there looking like... You know, that is like part, that is part of the Drag Race experience because especially coming from like smaller towns, mm -hmm. no one's gonna tell you you're doing anything wrong. Oh, so it was like, sickening in my town, yeah, you know, it's, it's, worldwide. It was. Ooh. It's not until you're on television with millions of people watching that someone says like, "Hey, you know your wig looks fucking atrocious, right?" <laughs> yeah. And it's like, well, I wish you would have told me that like four months ago before I was packing Literally. it in the suitcase. No, yeah, but I will tell you, it's a third person person perspective of you will really change. It'll either make you grow or just. Jenny Forrest Gump, you, where you're like, why? You know, and like about me at 4 a.m., yeah. which I've been there too, so. The fight with Alyssa, mm. was that as intense in person as it was on camera? Yeah, I mean, yes, yeah. I mean, it, it was pretty much what you see. What's so funny was season five, they really didn't have to really like manipulate us much because it felt very natural. Mm. But I'm not gonna lie, I love Alyssa so much. And it was really more, my feelings were so hurt that she was just like my my gal on the show. and. Like I was telling you, like I when she's like, who should go home and say Jade? I, I just was like, I don't know. It just kind of felt like you're my friend. So you're like, even if you do think that, like, how dare you, you know? And I just didn't realize at the level of my drag. And I will say Alyssa was very sweet. She did come and she did tell me. It wasn't like some big shocker, but I'm dramatic. And when I get mad, it's like Angelica Pickles, you know, I was like <laughs> over it at that point. And then to continue to talk about it, you know, I will also say I don't ever believe in body shaming people. You know, that's the one thing I've tried to grow from all of this you know there's a thousand ways you can argue with a person or be mad at a person and body shaming is not the way to go mm -hmm. and uh, I think sometimes when I was younger I just always wanted to like cut the deepest but that's just not appropriate and especially when it's over something so trivial I love that I said back rolls and she's turned it into bank rolls because that's karma and I think that's beautiful mm -hmm. so you know I will you know with that being said I, I appreciate the memes and the fandom, but I always have a hard time pill swallowing it and being celebrated for that. Yeah. And that's a big, like a big reason why I kind of try to want to change my narrative. Um, just because I don't know, that doesn't really represent me or me as a person. It was more representing me in a moment of feeling overly emotional and feeling hurt and being defensive, if that makes yeah. sense. So you were that kid growing up where someone's just like, you're ugly and you're just like, well, your mom is dead. Yeah, I know, just, literally. Yeah, very twist of the yeah. knife. Like your old club foot, you know. <laughs> uh, so, something else a lot of people don't know is that you also uh, experienced bipolar disorder. Yes. Is that something that was like, as you were talking about being like very like, defensive on the show and like combative, was that like a side effect of like the bipolar disorder you were experiencing alongside the craziness that is Drag Race? That's, I mean, that is a really good question. You know, I, to be honest, and it's a little bit embarrassing, but growing up with my family, my mom was a nurse and us being so Christian and stuff, they always, they didn't think like bipolar was a real thing. We always kind of took it, it was depression and like, Josh, you can get over this, or you know, this is something that you can get through. And for me, I was always extra hard on myself. I think always thinking like, why can't I just get out of this? You know, when, when I go through the ups and downs and it wasn't until Dracula, I mean, gosh, you know, my thirties, that I really took it seriously. And, you know, I'm so grateful for the boys and for Ian and for you know, Nathan, uh, the production team. They really were so kind to me and really pushed me to take care of myself. I think that's why I'm, you know, I'm being able to do this with Taylor and all that because I've just, I 
am taking care of myself mentally and also being very conscious of how I treat others, mm. you know, so in understanding bipolar more, now I can understand my episodes or just things where I feel like if I can be preventative while being medicated, then I will do that. You know? mm -hmm. Back whenever you were filming Drag Race, were you even aware of like your, your bipolar disorder or was it just something like you just didn't know why you were like... I was still currently thinking um, that I was just having depression. So at the time, I always was feeling I wasn't feeling like what I should be feeling. Mm -hmm. So I kind of overtook my medication and I would forget things or, you know, I would be even more emotional than I would normally be. So it was a little bit difficult, to be honest, because I feel like sometimes... I kind of dimmed my own light because I just kept worrying and worrying and, you know, over medicating and not understanding why I was getting so upset, you know. So sometimes it's just hard to talk about because you talk about these things it almost like ruins the illusion. Like, oh, you're a real person, you know, like, oh, you're sad. Like, but I think we all do that. I think we're funny because shitty things happen to you and you turn like that big pile of shit into something hilarious or learn a way to cope with it with comedy and I think that's you know or smiles or illusions or whatever it may be so mm -hmm. happiness is the illusion happiness is the illusion. That's the illusion but hey you know fake it to make it I will tell you you know just even pretending sometimes I find that helping a lot because then you do almost genuinely do you just kind of mm -hmm. change your mindset and your direction so post drag race mm -hmm. most queens are really busy with like bookings and everything but you had time in your schedule for a day job as well and you I worked with people with disabilities what was that experience like do you ever think like are we a good person? <laughs> Have we become super selfish? I think I, I like Angelica Pickles, I feel like sometimes I have had so many wonderful friends and family sometimes, but they're like, Jade, we really can't say anything to you because it's like, you know, Jade's world, you know, or like whatever that little kid that's on the, you know, Bobby's world. I feel like sometimes I've lived in like Gosh. Bobby's world and I don't know if I ever have been realistic as time went by about my actions and stuff. And so, I really wanted to know if I was capable of doing something that felt decent <laughs> and honestly felt fulfilling. And doing that, I spent about, it was about a year and a half and I had this amazing client. And it was so funny because when he had turned 30, he kind of lost like all cognitive abilities. And he did more than me in life. He went to college. He just like, just so many things that I hadn't accomplished as Josh, you know, like all I've done is like fight with people and be funny about it. But like, he had did like solid things and to think that he was incapable of, you know, there's nothing that he could have done to change what was happening. And then he was just the happiest person in the world. Um, I learned Magic the Gathering just for him and it's so fun. I was like, girl, wizard bitch, like, you know, I'm fighting people in there playing cards and we would go to wrestling every week. And I love wrestling. I grew up always wanting to be Trish Stratus. So I was like, it just felt so cool. A lot of times I feel like I'm such a brat and don't appreciate so much. And here he is appreciating everything. And that really made me feel different about how I see things and how I feel like I should be seeing things. I mean, I still keep in touch with him, but that time really definitely helped me know what I wanted to do now with this drag. You know what I mean? And how I wanted people to feel or how I wanted to treat them. And also shout out Madden Lee Edge. It is a nonprofit in Louisville and they really want, they don't define you with your disability. You, just like everyone else, and they pair you up with people with similar interests so you can go out and live your life to the fullest no matter what and I think that's beautiful. In the nature of helping others you also help grow like the alternative scene in Louisville like hosting like events like the uh, drag me to hell nights and stuff at what point did you start transitioning more towards what we consider alternative drag? So it's so weird um, I really 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 wanted to talk about that on Dragula and I really never got the opportunity because I feel like people are always like why are you here <laughs> and to be honest I you know, I if you've ever hung out with me at 4 a.m. in an undisclosed location, me doing unknown, undisclosed things, you know I'm a freaking monster. But with the <laughs> I'm the most crazy. I always think I'm like baby girl from A Thousand Corpses. Like, yeah, I'm cute, but I'm like, I'm crazy. So I will tell you, I do deserve to be part of the all community, but I didn't really realize that what that was. I'm not even going to pretend I knew what that was. And, you know, the police really opened that door to people feeling very open to showing different types of art that was like extreme, very like pushing the box. And Drag Me to Hell is probably one of my most proud things I think I've ever done in drag or what I did in Louisville, like to this day. People would try drive hours to come be part of the competition and it was real, like we had a splash zone because everyone was like, everything had to be blood, everything. Blood. I liked stories. I said, come and tell us a story. And when I, the way they would do it was extreme. I mean, I don't even know how they could afford bringing props. Like, I mean, we're giving away subway cards, but it, they put everything into it, like their family members were in their numbers, all of this. And 
distinctly, I remember being really touched. One of my winners for the finale, we were like, you have to bring glamour. And she had brought this whole knife, uh, like dress of knives. And it was talking about how she used to be a cutter and like, you know, that was her way of dealing with things. And she had this beautiful monologue, but she was talking about this demon is like what saved her. And watching her literally, you know, doing these things on stage and just kind of pushing the limits and being so raw, I just was bawling. And I just, I never really experienced something so real in drag. Because mm -hmm. for me, drag was always like, distract, you know, not be you, like, you know, be everything that you've never, you know, that you're not. And then watching these entertainers being so raw and still being so beautiful and then having these awesome costumes, it really blew my mind. And then them accept me, you know? Um, so yeah, it was really changing for me and my drag and where I felt like I wanted to change and what I wanted to be part of. Because you don't see Drag Race girls like, you know, stapling their faces or drilling their noses or, you know, any of that <laughs> or vomiting and then drinking it again or yeah. like eating thousands of bugs. But with alternative drag, like I know you started like hosting like the alternative nights they were having, but were you starting to drift more into alternative drag prior to that? Or is it something you kind of like fell into as a result of those? Well, to be honest, I honestly, I've never really known where I fit in, to be honest. I don't think I've ever been, I never really fit in with Drag Race, to be honest. I didn't feel like... I just never felt that sense of glamour, like this is me, you know? So with alt Alternative Drag and Dragula, it kind of made me feel, I could kind of show people how I really feel inside. And it kind of felt so freeing to not always being forced to feel like I have to portray myself being like so pretty, so small, you know, all this. I can be part of all of these things, but I I am not the living, breathing version of Dragula. I'm also not the living version of, of Drag Race. I kind of feel like I'm this weird chameleon that like, comes in as a part, but at the same time, I love that. I want to kind of try everything. It's just so fun to be part of different people's worlds and learn more and, you know, not have the burden of everyone being like, you know, you have to be this. This is your brand. Like, I have no problem that, like, I'm not the winner of these things because I feel like I have went and I proved a lot in my own right. You know, you don't have to have much and you can be successful. You know, you can be raw and talk about your mental illness or whatever and, that's okay. Like, I don't know. I, I've just, all these little things that has helped me be a better person right now. I'm so grateful for the shows and I'm grateful for all the opportunities I've had to get to this point. So it's still a win in my eyes. It's a good pageant answer. Oh, Solid. Thank God. Like, I saw this little alternative girl staple a dollar to pull her Shut forehead. I felt so inspired. As a drag race girl, I started stapling hundreds to mine <laughs> in solidarity. I could never do that. I love Ursula Major. She'll do like, you can staple like a 20 to like to balls and stuff like that. It's like the bigger the build, the more extreme you can do. I do love pain, but like, I don't know. Stapling is a little, it's a little extreme for me. Yeah. You can slap, like I'm like a slapper. Well, that that's outside of drag though. You know, that's, <laughs> we, we don't have to get into that. That's for the, uh, that's for the Patreon only. Yeah, that's the Patreon only. That's the Patreon only, yeah. How worried were you going into a competition like drag you love, like going from the bubbly blonde yeah. to like, oh, now I'm spooky. Honestly, not at all. I really went in because I, choosing Dragula is pretty much after I quit drag. I really was like, I had already, I was selling all my stuff off. I call it a mental breakdown, call it whatever you want. But I just, I was so exhausted from anxiety and just honestly, everything that drag is, it is hard. You know, it's a lot of constant um, worrying, you know, a pleasing, being a people pleaser, you know, we're always presenting. And I felt drag started becoming very like judging, very judgy, very like, you should be like this, you should do this. And it, it almost became overwhelming for me. And so, not that I gave up Taylor or any of that, but it was just nice to go on Dragula when they invited me. You know, the Boulets have always been gracious. They actually invited me prior to that season and I didn't go just because I I wasn't there yet. But um, it was just so good to be free of all of the preconceived notion, notions and just go on to be a freaking monster. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Just, I didn't know what would come from that, but a lot of good came from that. So. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm Taylor. <laughs> It's Dragula. A lot of queens from Drag Race, they kind of just like wait for the all-stars call or some even like outright like campaign for it. Mm -hmm. At what point did you decide, fuck it, I'm going to do Dragula instead? Because you like you were the first Drag Race girl to do that show. At what When did you decide to make that decision? Honestly, because my whole dream was, I did, I, I mean, I think we, all of us, we all want that opportunity at all-stars. And I did get considered, I will call it that. I don't know like how much I can say. Uh, for the season, I don't even know if I can say that. For a season... And when I saw what you have to prepare for and how many looks and stuff, it was overwhelming. And for me, I know that I never want to go back on TV and just be called poor again. 
to compete with so many people that have designers in their pockets, stuff and that, I don't really have that. I would have to create it or my family or my drag family or, you know, and when money only goes so far. To me, it just was more about, I felt self-defeated before I even got there. And feeling that, and when I didn't get it, I was so relieved because I was like, I don't have to disappoint anyone, you know what I mean? Mm. And then when Dragula came along, it's like I got to create my stuff and I was hands-on, it was like cosplay and like, you know, it, and I was being celebrated for things that I created. And Did they reach out to you or did you like audition for them? The bullies reached out to me, I will say I've been very fortunate. You know, they put the stamp on Drag Me to Hell, the contest we were talking about, they came, you know, they seen all the hard work I've been putting in and I just felt very fortunate that I, I was asked to be part of something like that, you know, and I was very reluctant just putting myself back out there. Um, I thought I did a damn good job. It sucks that my child, my cat died in the middle, you know, during the season, which is, I feel like was my downfall. I had to break the rules. Um, we obviously, you don't get your phone, but I wasn't going to sacrifice not watching him be put down. So I broke the rules and there was just no question about it. You know what I mean? Like TV, all this, it comes and it goes, but that was my cat of 20 years and like my best friend before I even had friends, you know, so. I feel like if I was on Drag Race and that happened while I was gone, it probably would have ruined me. So. It was like a 20 year old cat. It was like an old cat. Yeah, I, like, can, I cannot imagine what it's like to have a cat that's like been with you for most of your life. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, like the worst, I mean, through every boyfriend, through every mom, you know, and he was such a little human where I know it seems so silly, but I never felt like he was a cat. You know, I just remember being so young and so scared and he would like put his little head on the pillow and just like hold me. I don't know. He just had this kindness that I've never felt from people yeah. and I was just like you know he's so special but also feel like all the stuff that you because like you said you are 34 I'm not to out you but the age you are now like <laughs> yeah the age you are now like going back to like whenever you had that cat like that was with you from like the moment you were like kicked out all the stuff all you went it. through all the trials and tribulations yeah. starting drag drag race dragula that cat was with you for like all that yeah for me it was just like an emotional overload it, I, I didn't really know I haven't dealt with anything I've really cared about that much ever you know, passing. So I dealt with it the best that I can, but you know, it's just unfortunate that things happened the way they did, mm -hmm. you know, so. so sorry. It's hard. He's hard to talk about. I'm Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I didn't have it as a question, but no, I you're brought fine. it up. So cause I, I didn't want to open no, it up. You're totally like, fine. No, I, no, you're good. But uh, with Dracula, it was almost like a chance to like rebrand and like show people a side of you that you didn't get to showcase before. But due to the uh, extreme stress of the show and yeah. the pugnaciousness of some of the casts, <laughs> You found yourself involved with like a lot of drama again. What was going through your mind whenever that started to happen and you realized that, oh, it's happening again? Well, I will tell you, I love my mouth. I don't want to change how I speak or how I defend myself. And I think I was so worried that I was going to create this other back rolls moment and act exactly, you know what I mean? That I over... I was overly quiet. I almost like didn't have an opinion like I would normally have. Yeah. And I think that felt kind of unauthentic in a, you know, in a sense. I was also so worried about honoring the people that were my fans from Drag Race on Dragula, still trying to bring elements of who I was to this. It just, I, I feel like mentally I was just so over consumed that I really didn't know of a sense of like what I should be doing. Um, but at the, I will tell you at the end of the day, I'm always going to say what I have to say. I'm never going to be that little lamb. And also too, I know I'm a good person and I, you know, I will say people that are new to TV, they always feel like they have to do something like extreme or like all that. I don't really feel that way. Cause like when you've done the business and you, you filmed and all that, if you're strong enough or your personality shines, it's going to shine. I don't need to create this weird, awkward, you know, argue with you just to have a moment on TV. And I think that's such like a like it's such a grasp like you're you as a person or your art is not enough so you just have to fight like it just feels like such a desperation move is that what and, you felt like some of the other contestants were doing on the show oh absolutely i i did at the time like picking the fight with me you know it's like i always will have moments where i, I will you know there was so much off camera on dragula you don't see like we were all living in a house together where drag race separates everybody so a lot of arguments and stuff and like we're all drinking and everything like happened at the house so there was really no context to what was actually happening on the show, you know? I would say like, as someone like a viewer of the show, there's definitely, it felt like, as we were watching it, we're like, I feel like there's a lot more going on. There's more behind this that we're not yes, like seeing. Absolutely. Like, was there like a lot of like combative moments like happening at the house as well? Or was oh, there it really... was extreme combative moments. Like I will say moments that I not felt unsafe, but I felt extremely uncomfortable just because of a few contestants. And it's really odd because it's better to be authentic to yourself than try to pretend on TV because it just doesn't come off. And I think a lot of people just had a clear idea of how they wanted to be seen, how they wanted to act because it was like their time to shine. 
But I think when people respond in the way that they didn't expect, I think it kind of blows up where they don't. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And, you know, from being someone who came off aggressive, I do know that, like, that's not the way to go. For, like, you know what I mean? And I just, I didn't see the point in, even if I had something to say, I just didn't see the point really, really interrupting everyone to say it. It just, yeah. it, like, why, you know? Um, instead of where Drag Race, my, I kind of shined with all the backstage drama and I failed on the runway. I kind of felt at Drag Dragula, I was really going to excel and be shining on the floor shows. And then all of that to me just felt like that, that didn't, wasn't as, as an important to me, you know? And uh, granted, I know that's what everyone wants from me. Don't get me wrong, but I feel like there's a time and place. I feel like if I'm going to be that big mouth, I want to bully a bully. Like if someone's bullying you, then yeah, I'm going to cuss them motherfucking, 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 motherfucking out. But like outside of that, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. Whatever, like you said, like you felt like as though you were like bullying the bully, like coming back, like someone that you felt was like unfairly criticizing and like. Well, and also too, Sigourney, I, I do. I never really experienced in a sense of people not accepting that type of drag and you know doing the alt show and drag me down stuff I was exposed to so many different types of drag that like here I came like you know baby Taylor and I accept all of it and it was just kind of odd that no matter drag race dragula people are all people are always going to be judgmental people are always going to feel away whatever it may be but um I will never regret ever not you know celebrating Sigourney well with that I was like listen like you went to the show like showcase some of your stuff almost yeah. like a redemption arc show people a side they didn't get to see and they saw like a lot of similar sides of being like, you know, combative and like yeah. strong opinions, you know. With that, did, did that kind of like sour your experience for Dragula when all that was happening? Or are you happy for like the TV that it created? I'm not going to lie to you. I don't. I don't like it. Like, you know, my I was so cognitive to not wanting to get to that point. And I love giving good TV. Don't get me wrong. I like, I'm grateful for all the funniness, but I just hate that. I feel like what I'm most celebrated for are always the things that I'm not most proud of. You know, I'm most proud of my floor shows and I have brought so many um, props, like the gag factor in Dragula is like the big factor. Mm. And a lot of the stuff I brought didn't necessarily always get to be seen, but um, I just, I wish it would have been more focused on, I mean, coming from season five, wearing those palettes looking like the NBC girl, you know, to what I was bringing on Dragula, I felt like it was a big, a big jump, but I feel like mostly what I'm still remembered for is being like, oh, fuck you, I can do that too, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was a moment of me being an extremely disappointed in myself because I just couldn't control my mouth. Because, you know what I mean? At a certain point, any person, can, it's like pumping a balloon, you know, poke the bull. And I do feel like bipolar is a hand of that too, where it's like, I have to speak up for myself. I have to say something because I do have value. I have been doing this for a very long time. I mean, you know, downing me as a showgirl is not downing me. I mean, the fact that I can do multifaceted thing and being a showgirl is damn fucking hard. You know what I mean? So that's why I feel like I excelled to even be there. But uh, I will always speak up for myself and I will tell anyone, you know, don't ever be a doormat. I may not be proud. I could respond better. That's what I need to work on. <laughs> it's the delivery it is, is what I need to work on. Yeah. But it's that, you know, you TV <laughs> turns you in that little kid that's defensive and angry and you just, you know, it's like, you just want to... But with both both experiences that you yeah. had between like Drag Race and Dragula, in hindsight, if you were to receive a call for like Drag Race, like for All Stars and like Titans, would you go back to either one or both or neither? I, I feel like I never want to disappoint people with this answer. And it's in all honesty, I think where I am right now, I love being part of the Drag Race fandom, and I think it, we've become so much, or the whole Drag Race universe, all of us as sisters, I think it's changed a lot, and a lot of the things that were problematic have been addressed, and we have progressed so differently from we were back then, you know, from mm -hmm. 10 years ago. But if I were to choose as me as a human being and me as a person, I think I would 100% love to go back to Titans, because I feel like I have so much more to prove, and to me, that type of drag is just so much fun. I don't really know right now if I would do all stars or consider it just because I don't know if that is my passion in drag. And having mental health issues, I don't know if I really could be under that microscope to the extent where I get a little more grace on Dragula because at least we're monsters and, you know, we're proud and we talk about our problems and issues where I feel like if I had to go back on there, it almost feels like I was gonna, I would be putting myself back in a box that I wouldn't be able to obtain, if that makes sense. And it's not, no one's asking me to do that, but I feel like I would do that to myself. So until I feel like I get to the point that I would really show people something of value and something that is me, I wouldn't do all stars yet.
Be like, whenever Taylor announces a new tour, then I'll do All Stars. Uh, if I can do 32 looks as Taylor, I am 100% there. <laughs> it's just season of a thousand Taylors. Uh, I, 100. If you invite me and that's yeah. the thing, yeah, <laughs> I'm there. All right, last question. Probably, okay. the, probably the most important. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> you better stop. I love you. Okay, question for you. Are you, have I veered you any more into the Swifty fandom? I mean, like, I appreciate her music. I don't know. I feel like... Tell it... me your favorite song, quickly. Huh? Tell me your favorite Taylor song, quickly. Uh, I Kissed a Girl. <laughs> no, um... I've enjoyed the time <laughs> I, I remember, like, whenever I was, uh, whenever I was in, like, probably middle school, because uh -huh. I, I was still young when she hit the scene. I, um, that was the point in my life where I still hated country. Mm -hmm. I was like, Ooh. well, it's like a weird self hate because I actually love country now, yeah. but I think I only hated it because my family loved it so much. Exactly. You know yeah, what yeah. I mean? It's, like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's what it was for me too because like a lot of my family loved it. And I'm like, mm, you know, counter rebel. Yeah. And uh, so I, I missed the initial like Taylor boat, and then whenever she started to hit pop, I was also like, oh, I listen to like emo music and like rock and you know yeah. stuff like that. And so it's so just, maybe like, Dracula's next for you. I had to. Yeah. <laughs> Would you do Dracula? Well, not right now. Like I'm still like. <laughs> I still like You're like races. they love me. Yeah, I'm, I'm still doing good right now. I don't, I'm, I don't sell out yet. <laughs> I love like Dragula as a show, but it's just like I just know I'm not spooky, you know. Really? I just, yeah, I just like I don't know. Like I have no desire to get into like that level of spook. Gotcha. But there are some queens that kind of like go between worlds. Like I said, you go like Taylor, then you do like kind of the spooky alternative. Okay. Lucy Laduca does classic Hollywood, but yeah. then it's also like she a brought big, some really cool horror looks. Yeah, design. she's really uh, into like horror too. Like I can see that for her, but for me. No. Right, my last question for you, now that oh. I've become the interviewer. Oh, goodness. So if I ever got an illusion show, and you were in my illusion show, mm -hmm. who would you be? I'd do Jade Jolie. I would show up like this, <laughs> and I would be like, I was also on Dragula. So you're my alternate. Yeah. <laughs> I would do Taylor with a white scleras. I accept that answer. Yeah. <laughs> I love you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I, I love you. You're doing the sign off for me right now. I know. Now. I'm like, thank you guys. Yeah, it's been a Here's our show. final moment. <laughs> yeah. But she is correct. That is the end of the show and my last card. So, with that, we end the show. Thank you all so much for tuning in. And thank you again to Drift for sponsoring this episode. Link in the description. So, Jade, where can people find you? What do you have going on? I know you're bouncing around with the Taylor tour right now and you're performing at the Garden. Yes, uh, my life is so sporadic. Who knows what's next? But you can still catch me doing Taylor, uh, traveling around. You can catch me at the Garden in Las Vegas. And if you want to follow me, um, I'm so Gen Z and young now. I'm on TikTok, uh, Instagram, Twitter, Queen J. Jolie or Miss J. Jolie. Mm -hmm. Your TikToks have been popping off a little bit. Like some like your little dances. Yeah, I'm like. Yeah. yeah. You're like an inspiration. I'm like, wow, you really can't dance and you're getting so many views. I'm a real recognize real. We're doing what we can, what we gotta well, do. Well, when you set the bar low, you don't <laughs> keep lowering the bar, girl. Said, the bar is low, but bitch, we can limbo. Listen, I feel like there's something to doing to being this successful for always doing the bare minimum. Yeah. You're always successful if your standard of success is low enough. You yeah. know? Yeah. It's like we're not at the trailer park anymore, so we are Gucci. We oh, are good. Oh, Maddie, to one trailer park girl to another. Let's hey. do a Swifty Heart for him. A Swifty Heart. Yeah. <laughs> All right, <laughs> but yeah, thanks guys for watching. Join us next time whenever we have uh, somebody else. And yeah, till then, bye guys. <laughs>